Check one.
Hello, hello. Not so good at this. Okay. okay, great. Welcome, everyone. It's a true pleasure and an honor to be here opening this week of Darfur, a spotlight on Darfur at Harvard University, organized by the Darfur Action Group of Harvard students, with a panel as illustrious as the one I have here. Before we even start on the topic that we are going to discuss today, which is whether and how we can stop the violence in Darfur, I would like to make an announcement that is very important um, that Harvard made today. And I'm just going to read from a press release given by Mass Hall. We are announcing today the Harvard Corporation's decision to direct Harvard Management Company to divest itself of stock held by the HMC in PetroChina Company, Company Limited, PetroChina. Although Harvard maintains a strong presumption against the divestment of stock for reasons unrelated to investment purposes, we believe that the case for divestment in this instance is persuasive in view of the confluence of circumstances summarized below under the heading, Recommendation to Divest from PetroChina. We believe the unique pattern of circumstances relating PetroChina to the crisis in Sudan counsels in favor of taking the extraordinary step of divestment. The declarations of the United States Congress and the US Secretary of State describing the situation in Darfur as involving a genocide in which the Sudanese government is complicit. The judgment of a UN Commission of Inquiry that the government of Sudan shares responsibility for widespread and systematic acts in Darfur amounting to, quote, crimes against humanity and war crimes that may be no less serious and heinous than genocide. The apparent persistence of the crisis in Darfur, notwithstanding the recently negotiated peace agreement intended to end the North-South civil war in Sudan and several rounds of negotiations focused on Darfur, the salient importance of oil to the Sudanese government as a strategic asset and source of revenue available to fund military and other operations. The reports that oil-related activities themselves have exacerbated the humanitarian crisis in Sudan. The magnitude and scope of CNPC, which is the Chinese Petroleum Company's involvement in Sudanese oil production activities. The importance of its Sudanese activities and its overall range of foreign oil activities and the CNPC's status as a direct joint venture partner of Sudapet owned by, the, owned by the Sudanese government. The express inclusion of the GNPOC joint venture on the list of entities in which persons in the US are prohibited from doing business under US sanctions law. The fact that PetroChina's board of directors is dominated by CNPC senior management and recent reports that PetroChina itself may soon become the direct owner of international oil assets, including Sudanese assets now owned by CNPC, or that CNPC and PetroChina may form a joint venture through which they would jointly own such assets as a result of a contemplated corporate restructuring. For those of you in the student body who have, for those of you in following the activities of the student bodies, in lobbying for divestment, you will recognize a lot of this language because these were the points that were raised by students in memo after memo to the Harvard Corporation, urging them to divest in stocks that were linked to oil in Sudan, which was a major source of revenue for the Sudanese government in arming um, its militias in the actions in Darfur. So I'd like us all to acknowledge with a round of applause for the students. extraordinary focus and courage and determination um, and intelligence and care with which they prepared this work and worked together with the university's administration to reach a decision that is very unique in Harvard's history. Um, 
previous, previous divestments were made only relate, in relation to South Africa and tobacco. And these are decisions that are not made lightly. Um, and so thanks to the students and a tremendous acknowledgement to the work that they have done. Um, they, this was supposed to be a, a week um, to focus our attention on the problems in Darfur that continue and a week to raise the awareness of some of the problems that, uh, or some of the, some of the actions that might be taken. One of them, of course, was the question of divestment, which is now thankfully checked off that list. Um, but there are many other issues that uh, continue, which the Star 4 Action Group is uh, currently evolved in. And they pulled this week together of activities that lie in front of us to highlight some of the legal issues, the political issues, some of the the humanitarian issues in Darfur, and I urge you all to pick up some of the little green slips that are lying around um, that can guide you through this week of activities around Darfur. <coughs> Before we turn to the topic that we would like to discuss today, I'd just like to have Samantha Power, who's been very involved with the students in, um, in lobbying and working with the administration in making this decision to add some comments um, to close that topic off. First of all, um, I'm, I've just been totally blown away um, uh, by what, what the students have done. It's, it's truly extraordinary. And uh, you know we've already clapped, but I just want you to, as we're listening tonight to, to all the challenges that face us in ensuring that a peace process, a political track can be not just strengthened, but really created in a wholly new way for Darfur as we talk about the protection issues and the challenges and, and the humanitarian plight, we try to draw attention to it, to just have that clap in the backs of your minds because it's really uh, extraordinary. It's, it's, it's truly extraordinary. And I, I want to say something, um, I don't know now if it's sort of politically correct or politically incorrect, um, but about Larry Summers, um, because there are going to be a lot of people who probably note a kind of confluence of timing between this announcement and some of the controversies uh, that have existed on this campus now for the last couple months. And I just want to say, as one who's been um, in constant conversation with him since the students brought this issue to his attention in October, that this is all about Darfur. It's all about Darfur. And, uh, and I think it's really important while we can you know, have debates about you know, what should be going on within the Harvard administration and debates about confidence, um, that this, on this issue, uh, he has done something that is actually very politically difficult to do, which is he has moved the Harvard Corporation, the sort of creaky aircraft carrier that moves at a very, very slow pace and turned it to do something that's very risky, because it means now that, of course, every, <laughs> every student group uh, that, that, that uh, you know, isn't necessarily involved in Darfur, but everyone's eyes are lighting up and saying, ah, you know, now what about the stocks and such and such? And the corporation is well aware of that, and it really took a sustained campaign. I mean, it, it, it has taken almost six months to make this happen. But again, to stress, the, the controversies that he has experienced far from expediting this or catalyzing this policy shift uh, or policy cataclysm, you might call it. Um, if, if anything, uh, you know, the controversies have only delayed uh, this moment. And, uh, and so I just think in addition to crediting the students, uh, we just do have to take note of the fact that he brought an open mind to an issue that in most administrations, you know, if you come to an administration, you say, you know, open up your stock portfolio and let's, <laughs> Let's have a look and see what's inside. Um, you know, the, the only way to guard against the slippery slope of, of you know, uh, campaigns like yours uh, is to close the door altogether. And, and the door was open uh, when we started, perhaps only you could get a toe in. And then gradually, as the weeks and months passed, and as he became uh, alerted to the kind of you know, reports and reporting that's come out of International Crisis Group, out of the UN, from Alex and from others, uh, he really was uh, very open to it. So it is actually exactly how activism is meant to work. It's, you know, you bring the issue to the attention. You don't let it rest when the, the person whose ear you need to get gets a little distracted by things. Um, and then they actually have the capacity, knowing that he's going to be 
everybody's going to say this is pandering, um, but the choice was do you delay another two or three months and let more time pass, or do you do what is necessary now? So I think we should also, I'm not sure how many of you will join me, but I would really like to give a hand of applause to Larry Summers. Mm. Mm. So with that encouraging tale of activism in the back of our minds, let's turn to the next agenda ahead, which is to stop the horror in Darfur, which is still going on. We still have work to do. And with me on the panel to discuss this issue today on how the world can stop the horror in Darfur, I have four panelists who I would like to introduce um, who will be discussing this topic with us tonight. To my right is Alex DeWall who is currently a fellow here at Harvard, um, who is one of the world's leading experts on Sudan, um, is constantly there doing research on the ground, um, and has a particularly intricate knowledge of all the tribal issues and the, the, the difficult ethnic questions um, in Sudanese politics that affect, of course, also the, the issues in Darfur. Then we have Haile Mankarias, who is um, from Eritrea initially and has had been involved with the Sudanese peace process for over 20 years in various, uh, in various roles. First, as an Eritrean um, independence fighter uh, in Sudan and in the region, um, and then as the Eritrean ambassador to uh, the AU, then to the UN, and is now the UN's, um, heads the UN's department, uh, Africa One department in the UN's political the Department of Political Affairs, and is still very intricately involved with the peace process in Darfur. Um, to his right, we have Samantha Power, who, is, uh, who was the founding executive director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy, and has um, just recently actually been nominated as a finalist for the National Magazine Award for a piece she wrote on Darfur in The New Yorker, which many of us have read. Um, dying in Darfur. Um, beyond that was a Pulitzer Award-winning author for her book um, on a problem from hell, America in the Age of Genocide, and has been very intricately involved also in the process of lobbying um, on the issue of Darfur. As has the person to her right, John Prendergast, who is a special advisor to the president of the International Crisis Group and has had a, an illustrious career both in the Clinton administration and in various roles as in peace processes and negotiations in Africa, in various countries and in various roles, um, and has been very involved um, most recently in the, in the issues around Darfur. So welcome to all four, and it's an honor to have all four of you here. I'd like to start off um, with just getting a pulse check from each of you on what you think um, the biggest problem is today in actually stopping the violence in Darfur. Just a very brief comment from each of you on what you think are the one or two key problems that we face in getting our arms around this problem. Alex. I think that the absolutely pivotal question and the one that has actually received the least attention of all in the last year, in the last few months, is, is the peace process because the nature of the violence in Darfur is such that it can only actually be stopped with the consent of those who are doing it. it um, I don't think it's, it, it's feasible to send in uh, a force to confront um, and fight and prevent those who have been uh, committing atrocities. And in the absence of a truly credible and effective peace process, I, 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 I fear we're not going to be making much progress. I would um, agree with Alex that um, the, the, the root cause of this war um, is not very well understood, nor has it been really addressed. The consequences of the war, I think, what is what, uh, what has attracted international attention. In other words, um, the uh, suffering, how many people have died, what can, he, what can we do, in other words, you know, to stop this, um, this consequences of the war. Not equal attention has been given to dealing with the political causes, actually, to this war. The nature of the war, um, it is seen sometimes only as a war between Darfur as a region and the government as a central government. In other words, you know, the center versus a periphery, a certain region. Or within that region, just a particular um, group of um, 
of um, uh, clans or ethnic groups, it is not well understood that the Darfur conflict has an inter-Darfur aspect to it between the different ethnic groups inside Darfur. And um, Darfur was vis-a-vis -vis the central government. I don't think this is well understood, nor has an equal attention been given to its resolution, the resolution, the political resolution. Rather, it's the consequences that have been too much um, uh, sort of mm -hmm. emphasized and attention given to them. Um, while agreeing and, and endorsing everything that was said, I guess I would just say that, that I suppose it will be up to me to speak out for the consequences uh, still. Uh, and, and even though we are, when one talks about protection forces and deterrent international presences, we are definitely talking about stopgap measures lying in wait of a political track and a political solution that does, in fact, get at the root of the conflict. And on the political track, um, just to say briefly, it does seem to me essential um, that somebody of the rank and the clout of John Danforth, who has, of course, um, you know, is no longer the Sudan negotiator, somebody with convening power, somebody with access in all the major capitals, somebody who can go with begging bowl in hand to fund whatever the you know, enforcement mechanism ends up being, whether at a tribal level or at an international level, that this kind of appointment and anointment is essential in terms of this political track that both of you have, have mentioned. But in terms of actually dealing with symptoms, um, it is just indisputable that right now there are two million people, though we don't know these numbers are plucked from the sky, um, but internally displaced, uh, some number of millions of others uh, who are either remain in their homes under you know, threat of the arrival of war, or the arrival of attack, um, some number who are just wandering around, kind of afraid to, to hold themselves up in displacement, with displaced persons camps. And these sets of people, those not in Chad, but those still within Darfur, many of whom feel, in a sense, trapped within Darfur because they're too far from the border to make the run, how are we actually going to offer those people protection in the interim? Uh, you know, because we all know how long, it took, how long it took us to get at the roots of the political crisis in the North-South conflict, how long it took us to appoint a high-level envoy for the North-South conflict. You know, maybe we've learned our lesson and we can turn our attention to this uh, you know, with, 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 you know, with far greater zeal than we have so far, but the, the early signs are not good at a high level, you know, maybe in the UN, but at a high level, p p political level. So getting that African Union force up to speed and strengthened crucially uh, by NATO lift, logistic support, training, and money Right now, the African Union is debating uh, doubling that force, as you know better than I do. Uh, but the European Union, which is funding around, looks like 70 to 80 percent of the force, is resisting paying uh, for the difference. So even if you could overcome all of the logistics and the, the basic fact that we're trying to create this force on the, on the fly, um, and that we're, ever, we're forever sort of sacrificing contemporary victims on the altar of regional the reform of regional organizations, you know, we're always trying to build these mechanisms, never preventively, but always in a way as a way also to excuse uh, looking away ourselves. Um, we're going to have to get Western governments to step up and fund what is becoming the regionalization of protection uh, on the continent. So I think that's an urgent priority. Exactly what would be left for me. <laughs> <laughs> you have to follow these guys, it's not easy. Uh, in, in a complex emergency, there's always 63 things that you have to do at once. So all of these things are important, and we could go on and on probably for the, until 8.15 and tell you how many things need to be done right now. Uh, however, I think that I would represent uh, with Samantha the symptom side of the, of the uh, table here, as opposed to the root causes, the most immediate thing needed now, now that we have, by the way, for the first time, three significant victories in this campaign that all of you and all of us have been engaged in on Darfur for the last two years, which we can talk about in a minute. Now that we've got some victories, the key thing to move forward on now is this question of, of how do we protect civilians. We have a, a, and ultimately we have a responsibility to protect the people that are being raped and, and, and still being attacked and killed in Darfur. Uh, and that is our, that should be our, our number one priority. And how we do that uh, uh, can, be, can be the subject of discussion tonight, but generally speaking, uh, it falls into two categories. One is that there has to be the political will necessary to bring to bear 
on the Sudanese government and acceptance uh, uh, of a mandate that allows for the protection of civilians. They have accepted it in principle, but the AU hasn't uh, negotiated it yet uh, in its inability to, to really uh, move the, the ball forward. And as Samantha was saying, then the number of troops have to be radically increased if we're going to have the presence necessary uh, to protect people under that kind of a mandate. So between these two, I won't call them camps, but these two issues that we have among civil, uh, protecting civilians and of creating a, a, a sustainable peace process, um, I think that's where we're going to focus our discussion in the beginning. Before I continue, I'd like to highlight the fact that there are photographs, I think. Are there photographs up there? Can you, there were? There were photographs up there that I hope you caught um, as you were coming in that were highlighting the problem that John and Samantha were talking about, about the situation currently um, among ID, uh, internally displaced persons and refugees um, from a trip that, the, that Physicians for Human Rights did in Chad and uh, Sudan. Um, so I hope that you had a chance to see those um, uh, to, to get a flavor of what the situation actually is like on the ground. Um, let's start off, however, with this question of the peace process, perhaps. Um, since it is the one that is it, that that touches on on the obviously also touches on the one um, of the situation on the ground, um, to what extent do you see there being a f an overflow of positive energy from the success of the North South Peace Agreement into this situation in Darfur? Do you think diplomacy really has a chance um, in this region of Darfur, or where and where do you see the um, the biggest challenges to a diplomatic solution right now. Shall I start uh, on that I, one? <laughs> anyone may step in. I okay. just probably start with you two. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me let me start by by stepping back half a step on this mm -hmm. because of course the reason why we're having the Star Four Week here is because sixth of April is 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 the anniversary of the Rwanda genocide. But 6th of April this year has a particular significance in Sudan because it's another anniversary in Sudan. It's 20 years since a popular uprising overthrew the last dictatorship in Sudan. And there was, if you like, a Darfur week in Khartoum 20 years ago because one of the key things that sparked the popular outrage of citizens in Sudan, ordinary citizens, was the fact that there was a famine in Darfur in the neighboring region, Kordofan, which the government was denying and was not providing relief. And the, um, the intifada, the popular uprising, actually started with ordinary Sudanese citizens taking relief, taking food to their compatriots who were camped on the edge of the national capital and being prevented from doing that by the security. And gradually, over a week, um, there were organized nonviolent protests led by judges all in their full regalia. And, and April in Khartoum is hot, so imagine walking down the streets in, 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 in your judges' robes, culminating in, in the overthrow of that government 20 years ago. And, and I think there are two key points that we must take from that. Um, one of them being the sad point that... Um, at the time, those of us who were in Sudan, we thought things could never get worse. That was the real nadir, and of course things have since then got worse. The other being that there is a, a red line, there is a, a moral, um, a, a basic moral fabric of Sudanese society which was violated by the then government of Numeri by allowing millions of citizens to go hungry and hundreds of thousands to die during that famine. And I was recently in Khartoum, and it's clear that this government, vis-a-vis -vis its own citizens and its own core citizens in the north of Sudan, has crossed that red line. And one of the most interesting and encouraging things that I took away from me was the fact that the, 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 the core um, individuals and institutions that make up the very conservative fabric of northern S Sudanese society, the rural aristocracy, the tribal chiefs, the sheikhs, the Nazis, most of them ethnic Arabs, are outraged at what, what has been going on. And the most viable and effective peace process that is actually happening in Darfur is not the one that is, that is being um, pushed by the African Union and by the UN, but is one that is actually being headed up by a number of, of tribal chiefs from Darfur, most of them Arabs. Most of them Arabs who say, who are pointing their finger at the government saying, you got us into this, you are getting our sons killed, you are dismantling the fabric of our society, and you are also um, 
stigmatizing us, you're also ending up demonizing us as Arabs who have always got on with our non-Arab neighbors. And I think there's a tremendous impetus for sorting this out from within Sudanese society. I will pass on to Haile because I, I could then talk about what's happening at the AU and the UN, but I think that one of the key tasks of the peacemaking process is to link into that energy, which the government, I may say, is doing its best to undermine, to thwart, and to block at every turn. Just as a quick follow-up on that, is there pressure coming from within society as well to actually act upon some of the demands that have been coming from the international community to allow more support for humanitarian aid agencies or to go into the direction that Samantha was talking about, about opening up a little bit the restraints that the Sudanese government has been placing on the role that other agencies can play? Absolutely, yes. Yep. Yep. And, and also a very widespread popular support for the decision to refer uh, the case to the International uh, Criminal Court. Although, I have to, I mean, maybe we'll come back to this, one or two people have, have, have some concerns about that too. Mm -hmm. um, first, I, I just want to comment on what we were saying. It's, it is not um, to say, neither one of us is saying that the resolution of the political um, issues is not important or addressing the current issue, but you know, eventually why do you want the solution so that there would be peace and stability and, and um, um, uh, saving lives uh, of people. And therefore it is very important in the interim actually to do everything that is possible to ensure protection, to ensure actually that people during this interim period are saved from suffering and death and the rape that is, that is going on. That is very important as well. What we were trying to say is eventually, how do you stop this? You can always doctor it and doctor it and doctor it and get more support and more aid and more. Um, um, if there are forces that are not ready or willing you know, to, um, to come to a solution, to a political solution, then even 200,000 troops are not going to be able to, to stop it. Look, you know what happened in Somalia. There wasn't readiness actually to create a state, to come into agreement, and therefore even crack troops, thousands of crack troops couldn't do anything just against one Mogadishu alone. So what we are saying is equal emphasis must also be given to a political solution. I think the focus, and naturally so, within the public, within civil society, um, what you want to, uh, to emphasize is actually doing something about, about um, uh, stopping the killing, the, the, the security, and um, feeding and supporting people. What we're saying is equal attention has to be given to ending it um, uh, as well, and only a political solution can do that. The strategy for the solution, I wouldn't go, uh, since Alex sort of covered, in other words, the, uh, how the whole process um, of um, challenging really the ruling elite that is in Khartoum that has controlled political and economic power in Sudan from the time of independence um, uh, um, uh, started actually as a result of the war in the south, the coming of the Islamist um, government 1989, um, I think gave more focus to the south, to the struggle of the people in the south who are African, non-Muslim, non-Arab, and therefore um, uh, victims, actually, um, of an Islamist government that wanted to adopt Sharia law as if they are not members of, the, of, um, of um, um, this community, this state. Well, the process of the negotiations in the, in the South, there was hope that if this was to come to a conclusion, it would have a positive impact on the resolution of the political conflicts in other parts of the North, is because every, the South, Darfur, the East, all different peripheral, in other words, communities in Sudan are saying the same thing. We are marginalized from participation in the political and um, economic, in other words, power in this country by a small elite that have controlled political power inside. This is the key issue. It might have different manifestations, but this is the key question. So if um, the negotiation between the South 
and the government, that's the SPLM and the, and the government, was to conclude it would do two things that would be positive to the resolution um, of the conflict in Darfur. Number one, it includes principles, general principles of governance that would um, uh, sort of um, um, uh, be the May, I mean, the, the, the main principles on which the new government was to be established. And these principles are important for the resolution of all the other conflicts of marginalized peoples, in, in, um, in, in, uh, including Darfur, in Sudan, throughout Sudan. For example, the adoption of a federal government where different regions like Darfur would control their own um, internal affairs, uh, including a power sharing arrangement that is common to. Um, uh, federal government. So, number one, it includes principles on which the resolution of the problem in Darfur could be resolved or could be based. Number two, if the SPLM, which was one of the mar marginalized elements, were also to be included in the central government, then it would have a role in mitigating the position, in, the, in other words, of that government in favor um, of a, um, a, in other words, understanding the quest of um, the Darfurians and others who feel like them uh, marginalized from political power. And therefore, emphasis was given to that if it was to succeed, if, since it was also closer, it's been going on for years, if it was to succeed, it would give an impetus. But at the end, the key issue is that we should not forget that Darfur and the South Sudan and the East of Sudan, which is now rising up again, will all have to live in one Sudan. And therefore, we have to think of a national framework that will, um, that will um, in other words, include all this. This was the strategy. So a national conference that includes all the stakeholders, including those in Darfur, those in the East, the South, and those who are also the parties in the government, would be the key aim at the end. But you can't leave Darfur to burn in the meantime, in the meantime, you would continue actually the Abuja process which has started by the African Union. There is a multiplicity of actors. In other words, in the south it was IGAD, there's a south-north process, there is a uh, Darfur versus the central government process going on in Abuja. There is an internal, what um, uh, Alex actually mentioned before, um, inter-clan process in, in, in Libya, and um, a process between the government and political parties, the traditional parties, political parties in, uh, in Cairo. All this sounds to someone from outside actually very confusing. What is the interconnection between all of them? It is the government wanting to be at the center, trying to deal with this one and deal with that one and deal with that one. And in, in, in the longer run, actually, it, uh, it, it maintains its, right. uh, its uh, central position. And I, uh, we feel that this is not going to lead really to stable peace in Sudan, that there has to be all the stakeholders inside Sudan should come in a national conference and agree on governance for the future of Sudan. John, do you have some... Just like, keeps I, rolling downhill. Just keeps rolling. I, I, I'd be um, dying to hear your assessment of sort of where you think the sign, whether there are signs of hope there, whether yeah. you think this is all just too muddled for anyone to be able to wade through. <clears throat> I'll put a finer point on what Haile's saying. I think that the common denominator here for this, for all these different processes is that, that are being uh, undertaken, that the government itself is part and parcel of and often engineering uh, is, is very simple, political science 101. It's, it's divide and conquer. It's, it's maintaining power by absolute, by maintaining absolute power by any means necessary. In, in, in the case of the South, and, and the central part of the country, negotiations became a viable tactic to, to maintain power for the time being. They'll come back to the South again, I guarantee you that. This peace deal is not gonna be implemented unless there's significantly increased international pressure on the government. Uh, at the same time as they're making peace with the Southerners, they're ramping up military operations against the Darfurians and preparing to do so against the Easterners. So they do what they have to do uh, to maintain power. Now, can you make and implement peace with mass murderers who double as absolute dictators? Uh, it's a good question. Again, political science 101 question. Um, if so, if you are going to succeed at that endeavor, you have to change fairly radically the calculations of those 
dictators and murderers. Um, and you do that, in my view, and I think we may have a difference of view in this, on this panel, you do that through very strong and vigorous and harsh uh, international pressures. Uh, you bring out the sticks, you, you, you sharpen them, and you, you find the biggest ones you can, and you go to work on them. Um, and, and we haven't done that. We've been, we've been sampling the carrots and laying them out in a nice deli, saying, wouldn't you like to have these? And, and we see what it's got us. Um, and I know that we have a difference of view on this panel. Let's see if it'll come out. Um, <laughs> I think it, it took 15 years for the government of Sudan to decide or understand, to realize that they couldn't defeat the southern-based rebels, the SPLA. It's 15 years, perhaps a million and a half people of the 2.2 million that actually died, uh, perished during that period of time. I think that they have not even remotely reached that position of believing that they can't defeat the rebels in Darfur, which means many more people will die unless we change their calculations. Um, this government it will use uh, and continue to prosecute a counterinsurgency campaign that borders on genocide, that is genocidal. Um, so if there's going to be any success in the peace process, the prerequisite has to be that we have to hammer this government back to the peace table at the same time as, as exercising much more leverage and pressure on the rebels, I'm not leaving them out of the equation, we can talk about that, but believe you me, the government is the problem here and we need to work on that uh, uh, to influence them to actually have an interest in making peace with their own people. Samantha, I'd like to draw you out on the, some of the points you were making before in relation to this hammering on the Sudanese government on what needs to be done and how they need to change what they are doing now could share some of your, you were, you were alluding to the need for a lot more international pressure and international cooperation. Can you flesh out some of the ideas that you just sort of outlined then? Well, I think the fact that, that there is this multiplicity of actors, um, I mean, let's be clear, anybody who's involved feels like those processes are a symptom of each of those entities actually having regard for the situation. Mm -hmm. But if you take a step back, the, the, the number of actors how do I say this, is usually inversely proportional to the amount of concern. <laughs> if you're serious, you know, we know what it looks like. You know, we, 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 we've seen it. You know, we, 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 you see it in the Middle East when we get serious, on the, on the occasions that we get serious. You saw it in the Balkans, you know, in the, in the 1990s. Um, but if you're not serious, a proliferation of actors becomes a symptom. Again, with, with, with all the best intentions of those actors themselves, this is a government, as John has pointed out um, uh, so powerfully over, over the last few years, that responds, that has proven that it responds uh, to pressure. And one of the reasons I made the point about the high-level envoy, uh, I mean, that the, the, the nationality of the envoy is much less important than the access of the envoy. Mm -hmm. And the ability of that envoy uh, to gather these, um, you know, ultimately what will become polarizing forces or uh, sort of you know, centrifugal forces, you know, that push. Uh, on the one hand, it's all about the consolidation of power in the center, but what it ends up doing is pushing this issue of Darfur out to the periphery. So I think one thing is just, um, you know, to really, we, we know what it looks like, uh, again, when, um, when African governments are serious and when Western governments are serious. And the fact that, um, there has never been a ministerial meeting on this. I mean, it, Condi Rice now uh, is talking about Darfur more and more, but, but with, with, with what ideas actually in mind? With what, she has convening power. Somehow, even with the colossal erosion of American legitimacy, the United States still has the ability to get people in a room. Um, John and I met with the Secretary General um, last Monday. The Secretary General has tremendous convening power. Uh, we can defer, you know, to the land of the possible as it's currently structured, namely that we're going to be dealing in increments in figuring out whether the African Union force goes from 2,300 to 3,200, it's, it's what is meant to be its strength at present, whether its mandate gets tweaked or transformed, whether within a bad mandate it can do good things, whether it might double its force strength to 6,000, but, but as Haile has said, you know, 
ultimately, you know, these are just going to be tweaks. And in the meeting with the Secretary General, one of the things that I said, and John, I apologize for repeating oh, I'm myself. Just point at you. I, 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 tell him that story. I, I never repeat myself in front of John because he holds me accountable. Uh, I will be referred to the ICC. Uh, <laughs> But, but one of the points that I made to the Secretary General was that um, during the Rwanda genocide 11 years ago, which began 11 years ago this week, um, all of us, people of good faith, um, I wish more of us in fact, but, but people who kind of meant well, we, we were so knowing of what was politically possible. We were so shrewd and kind of getting, you know, what the traffic would bear in Washington and, and on the continent of Africa and among, you know, with the Belgians and with the French that all of our efforts, believe it or not, while 800,000 people were being systematically butchered, were channeled toward three things. One, surprise, surprise, humanitarian aid, very important, gotta feed symptoms, of course. Two, surprise, surprise, this is what diplomats do, securing a ceasefire, even though, you know, if we had actually secured a ceasefire, it would have stopped the only intervening force that was actually gonna bring the genocide to an end. Not a terribly noble force in and of itself, but nonetheless, the force that was going to stop the genocide, the ceasefire, would have benefited those who were carrying out genocide. And three, and this is the point I really want to stress, from the standpoint of outside intervention, radio jamming. While 800,000 people died, we pushed hard and in really sophisticated ways for radio jamming. And only history shows us the incommensurability of that. Yes, there was hate radio, and yes, it was used as a tool of genocide, and yes, anything, of course, that gets in the way of a regime intent on that degree of extermination, it's a good thing to get it out of the way and to make life a little more difficult. But by, by creating the, the, the boundaries for debate around a policy tool that minuscule, or, or again, that incommensurate to the degree of violence being carried out, we ensured that we didn't even get that. And, and one of the things that I, that I think we, you know, with, with the argument that John and I put forth in our meeting last week was that these tweaks to the African Union mandate, to a large extent, are the equivalent of radio jamming. Mm -hmm. They are about, you know, making us all feel just a little bit better, you know, about getting something done, but next to, you know, whatever it is, 300,000 people dead, 3 million displaced, you know, a peace process that is lying in tatters. At the African Union ramp up is the equivalent of, of, of radio jamming. And so we've got to, with the political process in mind and an end state in mind and with sufficient clout behind it, articulate not what is possible, but what is necessary. And then maybe if we're lucky, we'll split the difference and get something uh, in between. John, I'm, I'm, you, you, you hinted at our, our disagreement. I want to take you up on the lessons of history <laughs> here. Because we have, I mean, you know, you and I, all of us here, have been in the business of watching Sudan over the decades, and we know that, that you know, although Darfur is uniquely awful, there's been the Nuba Mountains before that, the south, the oil fields, which in their own ways were just as heinous, just as horribly bad. And, and I think there are two lessons we need to take away from um, the, the experience, particularly of the last 10 years, when, um, I mean, I, th I, you know, I think when you were in the administration, the administration did get serious about Sudan. The Sudan policy was adopted. And a couple of things emerged from that. One was that in the late 1990s, the pressure that was put on the Sudan government was an order of magnitude greater than any pressure that can be put today because the pressure was put by the neighbors. The pressure was put by the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Eritreans, and, Uga and the Ugandans who had tens of thousands of troops. They had tank brigades in Sudanese territory taking towns. That it was a very big, very sharp knife at the throat of Omar al-Bashir. We haven't got that now. Sudan has been let out of its regional box. And um, the, the, the measures that we have, with the possible exception of the ICC referral, which is aimed right at the heart of this security cabal in government, are nowhere near as big or as sharp as what we've had before. And it seems to me the, the, the point isn't how hard you clobber this government, but how smartly you clobber this government. And the, key, the other key lesson is that when we got a result out of this government, and the end result, I mean, what has solved the problem in the Nuba Mountains, in the south, in, you know, in, in the oil fields, et cetera, and it may not be an incomplete, it may be a precarious solution, but it's a solution nonetheless, is a negotiated solution, which came about partly because there was pressure maintained, but more significantly because an end point was defined. A, 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 a winning line was put, and, and, and a message was given to the Sudan government, you cross that winning line, you know, 
your, your home and drive, mixing the metaphors. Now, because they, as it were, broke the deal and went after Darfur, of course the winning line has been shifted. Fair enough. You know, these, can be, the, the, these guys are not the most honorable citizens. They don't tend to keep their word. But it seems to me that the, the, the key element that's missing in this mix is less the pressure, because the pressure is now being ramped up. The key is what is the solution at the end of the day, because less pressure towards a clearer solution to me is a smarter way of exerting pressure than just clobbering, making the bare dance, but not making it clear which direction you want to move it in. I'd much prefer more pressure towards a clear solution rather than less. Um, and I think that the, uh, that the lessons that we're both, or the, the, the evidence that we're both examining, uh, Alex, we, we just simply come away with different uh, conclusions from, which is fine. And you're smarter than I am, so I'm worried that I might be wrong. <laughs> However, we'll continue on since I am on stage here and I've got to defend my position. Uh, but I think, you know, you, you mentioned very rightly that, that, in fact, what we constructed in the 90s when, during the Clinton administration was, in fact, that inside-outside pressure game where we worked very assiduously with the Ethiopians, Ugandans, and Eritreans to apply the military pressure that we couldn't because we didn't have the courage to say publicly, this is what our policy will be. And so we then focused on the diplomatic uh, uh, pressure. Now, two-thirds of the pressure that existed then uh, still does exist. The Eritreans are still raring to go, want to go across the border. And the Ugandans are inside Sudan, though they have a very different and complex thing. It's the Ethiopians, which is the big daddy of the bloc, that have stepped back for economic considerations and, and regional political considerations away from that alliance and thus destroyed it. Um, and so I think that what we have now is, as you say, is have to be much smarter. And I think that the pressures that we've disagreed about uh, over the last few years are starting to, uh, to be put into place slowly but surely. And then we're going to have to see who was right uh, with potentially catastrophic implications <laughs> if I was wrong. Because as I said at the beginning, that you know, we have three new, brand new victories uh, on Sudan. Uh, during this last week. We have what you just announced a few minutes ago, the divestment, which I think will importantly set off a chain reaction. How is Iowa State or, or, or give me one, uh, or Arkansas or any other groups, places where people want to have divestment going to say, well, if Harvard did it, boom. Uh, so I think we're going to see quite rapidly uh, other universities and other, other institutions move on this because of what Harvard has done and what Harvard has argued. So that's very, very important. That's one victory. Second victory is we got targeted sanctions against the regime. Third victory is we have an ICC referral, which we'll talk about later. In other words, we have started to put in place the edifice of real smart pressure, pressure that's targeted that says, you have committed crimes against humanity. You're going to pay a price now. Now, how are we going to handle the diplomatic part of the equation so that we use that pressure to get what you're talking about that we got in the Nuba Mountains in the South, which is a, finally a comprehensive deal for the entire country? And that I think we agree on, is that if the, if the pressures are smart, you follow it up with good diplomacy. We're not following it up with good diplomacy right now, which we ought to talk about too. But at the end of the day, we probably meet on the other side of the moon and, uh, and agree on a lot of things. <laughs> With four open questions that I still uh, would like to draw out of this, with the ICC uh, referral as a, one of them, and the what is smart diplomacy, and how do we protect the civilians, I'm still going to have to give up my role as the moderator and hand over to you so that you can ask questions, because time is ruthlessly ticking um, much faster than I would like it to. Um, so I'm encouraging you to keep a lookout for the four microphones that are here in the in the forum. Um, and if you have a question, please make it short and ending in a question mark and avoid the opportunity to make a statement of your own. Um, also, please introduce yourselves because it is interesting to know who is engaging in conversation with the panelists. So please, introduction, question mark, brief, and then the panelists will be happy to answer. Please specify also to whom your question is directed. School of Public Health. Um, this is sort of generally directed. I was just wondering what efforts have been made to engage the Islamic world in what is essentially a Muslim on Muslim conflict? Yeah. 
Yeah. Open. Um, <laughs> you know, by the way, when we pause, it doesn't mean we don't have the answer. It means we're being respectful. So don't laugh at us. <laughs> laugh with us. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, let me say that, yes, um, 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 Islam on Islam, but uh, I think we should, we should understand this is not just an Islam issue. It's an issue of, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a bit, um, you know, outdated to say a class, a certain kind of, uh, in other words, you know, elite that is in power that uses whatever means it has um, to, uh, to stay in power. Um, the Arab League is involved, others are involved. The question is, is there a clear understanding of where the pressure points are that get us to the desired end, and who can do them? I think that's the important question. Where can you bring, for example, the, uh, the, the Arab countries? There is a tremendous suspicion from the central government now, from those who are, from the elites actually, who are in power. Um, the reason why these negotiations are working, are, we are hoping that actually they would work, is because there has been in the government a split. You know, it was a very extremist government, Islamist government, and there was a split between the very extremist part, which was Hassan al-Trabi, led by Turabi, and um, uh, uh, the rest, who are led by Omar al-Bashir now. And that then gives the possibility, therefore, whereas initially the goal was regime change. This regime has to go. Otherwise, with this ideology and with this practice, you can never negotiate with a government like that. That's why the fighting sort of intensified. You fight against such a government. Well, now, because there is a government that is amenable to negotiation, to pressure, um, the policy has to change. It has to be not regime change. You are going to go. We are working to get you out of the way. If you say that, I've been a mediator you know, for a long time. If you say that, then there's no incentive to, I mean, to, to negotiate. I think the pressures should be directed at this government. If you do the right thing, then we would want you to be part of a coalition that would be a transition to a stable political atmosphere. Well, who can best deliver that? If you accept, um, uh, and we, you know, we must, if there is negotiation, this government um, that uh, not only negative pressure, but positive encouragement also, that if you do the right thing, then we would support you in doing that right thing. Then um, those they feel closer to them perhaps could do a better job of delivering that, uh, delivering that message. And therefore, definitely there are Arab countries um, involved. That's why Egypt, for example, which has a very close relationship with the traditional power elite in the country, is trying, actually, um, uh, to get them together. Um, that's why appeals have gone from the Secretary General for the Arab countries to provide troops, for example. Um, in uh, uh, um, uh, monitoring troops in, uh, in the south, um, has been asking also Arab countries even to support humanitarian, uh, in other words, to provide humanitarian support. So um, it, it is a question of where exactly, what is the intended result you want, and where do you have the pressure point on who can do it best. I think one thing we are lacking is the concentration is on the government. Of course, agreed, the government is the key actor here. It is the, the, you know, the, 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 the cause of all this, but not enough pressure sometimes is put on the rebels as well. The rebels are very divided. They're very divided inside them, within, within themselves. They're also very divided among them. The, gem, the justice and equality movement does not have the same political, uh, for example, um, policies as the SLM does, and therefore, who can put pressure more on them? I don't think the Arab countries are okay. They are Islamic, all right, but it's not the Arab countries that are supporting them. It's mostly Western countries, actually, that sympathize with them because of the result of this ruthless war and what it has done in terms of the population. There is a lot of sympathy, actually, with them. Without enough questioning as to what do they stand for. 
And therefore, um, it, it, it's, um, they are being invited actually to participate where they could be um, uh, uh, the strongest in encouraging as well, not only in pressurizing. Thank you. Hi, Rebecca Hamilton from the Darfur Action Group. Um, I'd just like to get a sense of what you think the impact will be of the ICC referral on those who are complicit. Um, I guess the opposing views would be whether it actually um, acts as a deterrent to stop the ongoing atrocities or whether it's going to take away the incentive for them to engage in peace negotiations. Can whoever picks this question up just briefly give the background on this decision of the UNSC? Um, I'm actually, I'm going to give a, a, a short response um, to the question, then I'm going to ask John actually to answer the specifics of, of the question about the political effect on the ground, because he's talked so much about accountability over the months. But in essence, although the United States government from the inception of the, um, well, from the inception of the Bush administration, but even from the inception of the International Criminal Court, has been at best in the Clinton years indifferent and at worst on a campaign of assault and destruction toward the International Criminal Court in the Bush years, um, to very much, again, uh, the credit of the uh, advocates, I think, in this country, and uh, specifically the, the pressure that's been manifest in the US Congress, both on the House and the Senate side, uh, very bipartisan uh, pressure uh, on the Bush administration. But by virtue of this advocacy and this pressure, this administration, which has not wanted to be a party to anything the International Criminal Court uh, has done, and again, has threatened to kill it and, and tried uh, pretty much everything it could do to kill it, you know, unsigning Clinton's signature on the treaty uh, creating the court. Um, but on Thursday last week, uh, the U.S. government decided to abstain from a U.N. Security Council vote in which Darfur, for, in the, in, for the first time in the ICC's history, uh, uh, the Security Council uh, referred a case of criminality to the International Criminal Court. Uh, the prior two referrals have come from governments, from Congo and from Uganda. They've said, come help, we have rebels who annoy us. Will you, would you mind prosecuting them on our behalf? This is a very, very different model and a much more uh, ambitious, much more threatening model to the state order because it is the Security Council uh, in a sense saying that the Sudanese government has not uh, prosecuted the people within its midst, that these crimes are of sufficient magnitude to warrant uh, a referral to this, the court that is only gonna hear the worst cases. So for the US government to abstain with China and Algeria from that vote, again, was an enormous uh, achievement. I'm gonna let John talk in a second about what the effect on the ground uh, will be. But just um, to raise two uh, issues now in relationship to the US role, because we can all sort of sigh and backslap and say, wow, you know, again, advocacy pays, and who knew that they could be convinced to, to put, you know, crimes against humanity uh, uh, ahead of their hostility to the ICC. Uh, they did for a day. But the ICC doesn't have a police force. It doesn't have an army. It is incredibly dependent on the intelligence supplied by UN human rights observers who are scattered in very small numbers uh, throughout Darfur, incredibly dependent on journalists who are increasingly unable to get access, una we're, we're unable to get visas to get into Darfur. It's a huge problem. You can see the precipitous decline in press coverage from the ground in Darfur, and an African Union that is present very much you know, at, the, in, at the consent of this uh, Sudanese government. So how is evidence actually going to be amassed so that these investigations go forward? You know, it's much, much easier to get enough for a preliminary, to, to launch an investigation or for even for a preliminary indictment than to build a meaningful case. So the real question is, will the United States be a part of this effort uh, in funding these institutions to actually support the International Criminal Court? Or if, if the United States isn't, as with the referral, Will European governments and other countries in the region and elsewhere themselves uh, supply uh, the pressure to make that happen? And then the second, I said I would be brief, and I'm never brief. Uh, the the I ICC, brief. Yeah, no, no. the, the ICC uh, is only going to deal with a handful. I mean, we'd be lucky if we saw a half dozen uh, indictments coming out of the ICC. The prosecutor at the ICC has made it very plain that his criteria is gravity. Uh, gravity of crime, gravity, most crucially, of responsibility. So you are not going to see this list of 51 that has been passed to him 
when the envelope is handed, it's tomorrow that, that Kofi Annan is going to hand him the envelope of the referral from the Security Council to the Secretary General on to the prosecutor. In that envelope are 51 names. Again, he doesn't have the resources. It's a new court, doesn't have the budget or the will to do anything more than a, a very select few. So what is Sudan going to do? How is this going to create a, a footstep effect so that that country or some other mechanism, and maybe some kind of African you know, residual uh, judicial process, takes hold so that it isn't just you know, the higher powers, but also uh, the people you know, at a mid-level who've been involved in the killing. But on the, on, the, on the perversity effect, whether it'll have a perverse effect on the ground. Thank you John. for my assignment, Professor. <laughs> I think uh, we go back to the, to the smart power uh, issue, smart pressure issue, sorry, power, I'm pressure, power, getting involved. So I go to sleep at night, there's power it's just lecturing me. Um, let's see, if the ICC uh, investigations uh, are well played, um, as they have begun to be played <coughs> in northern Uganda, I think they can have a very positive impact on a peace process uh, for Darfur. Um, it'll depend on how the process is constructed by the internationals, by the African Union and their, and their international supporters. Because currently, and Alex and Haile will definitely want to talk about this some more, the peace process is a complete joke in Darfur. If anyone, what, if anyone can name the lead mediator of the peace process in one of the biggest wars in, in, in the world right now, in this room, I got 150 bucks in my pocket is yours. One name you wouldn't know, because who knows? It's, a, it's absolutely a case of the AU dropping the ball in a, in a disastrous way, and the international community, the wider international community, not picking the ball up in any significant way and trying to move it forward. So we have to build a process that has a, a lead mediator that is recognizable, which has Envoy support from the United Nations, from the United States, from the British and the Norwegians and other countries that matter, and the Egyptians and others that will have an influence over, over what happens. And I think that the benefits uh, for the peace process will unfold as a result of the increased pressure that comes from the ICC. <clears throat> I'm thinking we'll take the next question from the gentleman up on the balcony. Um, my name is Isaias Chavez. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, I have two questions. The first one is... Um, Can you speak more slowly? It, oh, it, yes. <laughs> um, you have all mentioned one dimension of the conflict, that of between the center and the periphery. Uh, I was just wondering um, what, um, if at all, is the opposition or the political conflict, what political conflict exists within Khartoum, within the center? And the second question um, is, um, you've all referred to you know, ways of uh, clobbering the regime into getting it to oh seed God. things, and I was just wondering about the flip side of it, which would be how to provide incentives for moderation and for the moderates within the ruling coalition to come to power. Okay, Thank Alex. you. I, but before, before I, before <laughs> I let anyone name. jump on that, that you got your cue. Um, but there, I'm just going to take a couple more, given that we have seven minutes left. This, I, I think my watch is going too fast. Is it really 10 past eight? Um, but for, just a couple of questions, and then we'll call them together so that the panelists can respond to them. One from up there on the balcony, and then one down here, and then we'll, we'll take this one here, and then we'll try and draw <laughs> themes between them. All right, um, my name is Alex Damore. I'm a freshman at the college as well. Uh, my question regards not necessarily just the conflict inside the Sudan, but also sort of divides that might exist inside the international community. For example, it seems that China is getting involved <clears throat> in a lot of different areas in Africa to sort of support the status quo government because of economic considerations that they have rather than uh, necessarily supporting progressive human rights, uh, human rights causes. And so I was wondering what sorts of policy instruments could be used uh, by the United States and other countries that are sort of pushing for these human rights causes in the context of, uh, well, I, I guess in this particular instance of China that is being very supportive of governments for you know, its own economic considerations. Thank you. Uh, my name is Helen Fine. I'm affiliated with the Belfer Center and the Institute for the Study of Genocide. My question to any of the panelists is what role has anyone in the international community or NGO community, or what responsibility 
have they suggested for restitution and compensation to the victims of genocide and war crimes in Sudan? Thank you. Hi, my name is Selma Hassan, and I'm a Kennedy School student. And being Sudanese, I'd just like to ask the panel to delve more into the issue of mobilizing internal Sudanese support uh, for Darfur, especially with regards to John Gereng, who just signed a historical peace deal January 9th of 2005, giving him amazing compromises by the government. Uh, and John might be a pessimist about uh, if that's actually going to come to fruition. But um, what mobilizing force can John Gereng play, and what has he been doing so far in the peace process in Darfur, and what can he do um, more, if anything, or if he's any, in any power to do anything? We have a question around the political process and the internal Sudanese support, then one on the role of China and the international community, and then uh, <coughs> activity toward compensation of victims. I'm just going to open those okay. three questions, throw them out to the okay. panel, respond um, as you like. Let me, let me respond to a number of points, not, not in particular order. The answer to, to John's question about who is the mediator, it's a Nigerian guy called Sammy Bok. You're not, I was asking that. I, I, I know, <laughs> I, I know you were asking that. I, that was but, not fair, now I gotta give you 150 bucks. No, 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 I know. I, <laughs> I know you don't make much up here at Harvard, but damn. Yeah, I, I, and it's interesting, Sam has on his staff no single full-time person. Right. And he's not even full-time, he's not even on a permanent contract. The, the AU is running the Darfur negotiations on fewer staff than a medium-sized NGO in this country will have on its Darfur desk. And, and, and I think that's absolutely pivotal. Yeah. Um, just responding to the other uh, key points, I mean, the question of moderates in Khartoum, they, they're all hard-bitten uh, politicos. They're all, the, the term moderate hardliner doesn't really apply here. They all have different colors. They're all um, chameleon-like. In, in what they're prepared to do, provided they, they can survive. And I think the core is a sort of roadmap with um, an, 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 an ultimate outcome. Um, it's interesting, um, Helen's question. One of the key issues that arises in the, the tribal negotiations, it's a key issue that comes up um, before punishment, before tribunals, that comes from the, the, the intertribal process, is uh, uh, restitution, compensation, Restoration of land rights, those are the key things, with actually restoration of land rights being um, the number one. Um, Selma's point about mobilizing internal support, um, John Garin can be very key, uh, though the Darfurians would resist very strongly any indication that the SPLA was going to impose a, a solution on Darfur. But can I just throw one other thing out in terms of mobilizing external, uh, mobilizing internal constituencies? Um, things have changed a lot since 20 years ago when it was possible to get hundreds of thousands of people on the streets to have non-violent regime change. Um, many of the, the social institutions that mobilize that are much, much weaker. But some things are much, much stronger. Communications are much stronger. Um, cell phones, the internet has made a tremendous difference. And I mean, it, it's fascinating to see that even now, you know, more than 50% of the undergraduates at Khartoum University are women. And there is a tremendous capacity there among students in that university, that university which is a shadow of its formal, former self, but still tremendously hungry for engagement um, with the rest of the world, with the issues of the day, with, with, with intellectual life. Tremendous opportunities for linking up and, and, and mobilizing those people. Yes, I would, um, <clears throat> um, on the question of what um, Kang Garang do to push um, uh, the peace process throughout the country forward, I think the coming of the South, the SBLM, to participate in, in power, in central power, if it can be real power, is, is a completely new thing in, in Sudan. It is never actually shared uh, a southern uh, sort of um, um, southern participating in participation in central in central government has never happened in a real way and if it can be in a real way it's not just what garang himself can do it's what it does to the nature of that control of a of a small elite actually that's happened before unfortunately it, it isn't very simple 
you do have to understand that the South itself is not a united entity itself. There are problems in the South uh, um, itself. There has been fighting in the, between Southerners as well. I think Garang will have a preoccupation to form his government inside the South. Uh, it's forming, I mean, transforming a liberation movement into uh, all the instruments of fighting into instruments of governance, it's going to take quite some time and quite, um, and therefore we should not expect too much out of the South just coming and now all of a sudden the nature of the government is going to change. I don't think um, it can be overemphasized. The other problem I want to talk about about this disunity in the international community, the way it has approached it. I think this is one of the key reasons. We said not enough attention. Everybody is, understands the horrors that are, that are happening, actually, in terms of the humanitarian situation, in terms of um, 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 what is happening in, 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 in human rights situation, for example. Well, come to the resolution. How do we deal with them? There is division in that well, interests are not the same. Views are not the same. I think a mediation. The African Union has done really a very good job, both in terms of the mediation and in terms of um, uh, protecting civilians even uh, um, uh, to, the, to the degree that its capacity allows it. The question is there hasn't been unified support in one direction, unified pressure in one direction, full support to the mediation the African Union is trying to do. Uh, I, I was involved in the mediation in Congo. It could never work because different actors had different positions. When you know, all these attempts failed and all of them then focused in support of the mediation that was carried out by the UN and, um, and South Africa, it worked. I think that kind of unity is going to be required and that kind of backing is going to be required if we are to get at a political solution in Darfur also that will stop the war. Um, I actually will be brief, but just wanted to respond to the point about China. Um, uh, one of the things that was lost in our, especially this side of the panel, our, our solipsism, our American kind of narcissism where we are the center of the universe and we, we think only about the American role uh, in events. One of the most extraordinary things that, that happened as well last week is that China, which is much friendlier, of course, with the current government, uh, in Sudan and has much to gain uh, by my maintaining that warm uh, relationship, but chose to abstain both on the sanctions resolution for travel bans and asset freezes and on the ICC referral, even though it, like the United States, uh, is not a signatory and also conceivably has an interest in, in thwarting uh, the, 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 the progress of international justice. Um, I think that in about 10 years time, we will look back on the day when China resisted using its veto power uh, with great nostalgia. As its offshore economic ambition expands, as it is steadily doing, uh, so too I think we can predict much greater exertion of its political might in international settings. And given that you know, human rights is hardly factored into domestic policies, we can hardly expect uh, you know, the welfare of the Darfurians to be a, a major propellant, certainly in its judgments within international bodies. The other thing that China's, you know, in, increased rise and increased ambition will coincide with, presumably, is um, an Asian uh, Secretary General who takes the place of, of Kofi Annan. And uh, that, you know, doesn't mean anything one way or the other, but it is the turn of the region and the re at least you know, there are a variety of spokesmen within the, within the region, some of which believe that sovereignty is a, a fluid concept like the current Secretary General uh, has said it is, but others who take a much stricter uh, you know, interpretation of uh, the UN Charter's uh, presumption that you shouldn't interfere in the internal affairs of a sovereign state. So I think we should be looking at both of these developments actually with, with, with at least with, with great concern and, and hope uh, that the Secretary General you know, will prove an offsetting force and a legitimizing force for the continued scrutiny of internal human rights practices. Well, I want to also take on this, this China question. Uh, by the way, I, I love your hat there, buddy. Uh, I, you'll probably be making like five times as much as me in five years, but just keep wearing it for as long as you can. Um, when, I, when I was a kid, um, and this may be no surprise to anybody, my favorite game used to be chicken, you know, where you 
two guys ride their bicycles at each other and see who swerves off the road first. And this is precisely what we've been arguing for the last year about US policy vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese on Sudan, is that every time the United States laid down a resolution in New York that said, let's sanction the, Sudan the Sudanese government, let's go after them on this or that grounds, and the, Sudanese go and the Chinese government looked back and said, nope, we're going to veto it. We yanked that thing off the table as fast as you possibly can, laid down some piece of milk toast that, uh, that had absolutely no impact whatsoever on anybody's calculations. And, and finally, the, 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 the Secretary Rice got on the bicycle and said, OK, let's just see what happens. And a road right at them. And of course, they just rode right off the road. They're not going to veto anything. They don't want to be isolated. It may change in 10 years, but it's not going to change now. They don't want to stand up and, say, and be uh, subject to the possible accusation internationally that they're standing with a, uh, a genocidal regime, or at least standing in support of crimes against humanity. The talk a good game, they don't back it up. So we need to, we need to test them and, and push them on that as long as we can, uh, because it may not last. Uh, forever, as you say, as their interests uh, expand fairly dramatically. Um, let me also answer your question, Salo, or, or at least offer some comments about mobilizing uh, Sudanese support. Um, I think we, we need to be engaging all over uh, Sudan. When I say we, sorry, I'm going to now do what you just said, which is uh, America-centric, because that's where we are. We happen to be there. Um, and, uh, and I think that. Uh, uh, it, it is right now, instead of engaging, instead of making a, our presence felt in a positive way by engaging people, constituencies from all over the country, the diversity that, that Sudan is, instead the U.S. has, and this is a legacy of Clinton's policy that was wrong, that we, we lost that one on, is that, is, that, is that the U.S. has no ambassador. We don't have uh, any political representation whatsoever beyond a couple of people sitting in a bunker in Khartoum. Uh, and, and you can't do business like that. We need to be out there talking to people and learning and seeing what the, what's going on. We need an outreach strategy. We need a public diplomacy strategy. Our new target now is going to be Karen Hughes, because she's now going to be pulling a lot of this stuff together in the White House. This is going to be her job. And that's the person I'm going to be trying to influence now over the course of the next few months. But I also think that's sort of tactics. But strategy and substance is that the United States has to, has to promote and be seen to be promoting democratization in Sudan, to be seen to be promoting the, 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 what are basic elements, fundamental elements of this peace agreement that focus on uh, a transition to a democratic state, that, that allow for uh, the parties that were that were dr driven out of the process 15 years ago when the military coup occurred to come back in and to allow for a widening of stakeholders uh, in governance in Sudan. And I think we just need to test the governance of Sudan and, and, and see if a leopard can indeed change its spots. We come out of this evening with a long list of things left to do. We have a, we have a pressure to apply to uh, have meaningful support provided to the ICC in its efforts. We have pressure to apply. Um, on the international community to define what is necessary and what actually is the goal that we are aiming for. Pressure on the international community to join behind that vision. Um, pressure on the administration to actually get serious about having people on the ground and committing resources to engaging with the Sudanese um, population that is interested in being a part of this. So with this list of tasks ahead, um, I hope you will be in touch with the Darfur Action Group to see what else there is to do. Um, thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much to our panelists and our wonderful night.